Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd ahabat fillah continue on in our study of an siha by Shaykhna Shaykh Ibrahim Rahayli hafadhallahu ta'ala We were talking about and discussing the some of the criterion for hajr and about refutations and the Shaykh goes on to mention that refutations are uh, obviously not for everyone to involve themselves with and not every community needs to know and be involved in every fitna and every refutation that is out there. So for example, it may not, a bid'ah may not be introduced into a locality, meaning the people are not exposed to it, the people are unaware of it. And then you start talking about these new terminology, this person is mumayya, this person is this, this person is this, and the people are totally unaware and totally, uh, it's not something necessarily relevant to their community, nor do they need that. They need another type of tarbiya and building, but yet you've now introduced this and then the people are involved in this and the fitna instead of learning their Islam. <clears throat> so then the sheikh, he then said, How many laymen have been tested with hearing this, and as a result they begin to have doubts and suspicions about the fundamentals of the religion due to the fact that they read what was above their comprehension from the countless books of refutation, which none can enumerate except Allah. So it is incumbent upon those who hasten to spread these books amongst the laymen to fear Allah and to be cautious about being a source of fitna for the people in the religion of Allah. The most startling thing I've heard in relation to this is what some of the students have resorted to in spreading these books, these books of refutation amongst those who are new Muslims. Those who have only been Muslim for a few days or a few months, the students encourage them to read these books of refutation. By Allah, what they're doing is appalling. So this here, the Sheikh is making very, I think the, the Ibarat are very clear, and we, we just talked about that, that <clears throat> that this is not from tarbiyah, that this can actually uh, cause people so many di various types of fitna, as the sheikh mentioned, and a fitna in their religion. For example, as we, we mentioned prior to this, that for one, it can cause a person to question their religion. For, ex for example, as I said, I mentioned before that a lot of us from my locality, we didn't have anybody to really teach us, and we didn't really know. We were just uh, new Muslims, more or less, and we just, you know, we like to, we prayed and, you know, a lot of us, we still had one foot in the dunya, you know, some of us were still, you know, DJing and some of us were still doing this, you know, we were, we were new. And, but yet what was being fed to us was Faisal's tapes and stuff like this, a guy who's talking about takfir and this and that and the other, we weren't learning anything about Islam. But that caused so much confusion. Some people began to question, you know, is this the right religion? Is this religion about only that everyone's a non-Muslim except for this guy who's speaking? Because the way he made takfir, it was it was amazing. And at the same time, it was appalling. And so it can cause a person to question their religion. It can cause a person to deviate. It can cause a person to not learn anymore, but instead branch out into Messiah that are way over their head. Because I can recall also a lot of those very brothers, very same brothers, they would say quickly off their tongue, Bin Baz is Munafik, uh, Al Albani is a Murja, uh, Bin Uthameen is a Kafir. Da -da -da -da. You know, they would just res would reiterate what they heard from the likes of Faisal and other Tekfiris with no hesitation, blind following. And they could not, one of them could read a letter probably. I'm 100% sure. Maybe they knew the Alif Bata, they knew some of the alphabet, but they could not read a single a single sentence. If I brought them a sentence of any one of those major scholars, they have no idea what those scholars speak about. They only know what the transmitter, which was a Tekfiri like Faisal or Abu Hamza or uh, Abu Qatar the Philistini, they only know what they said and what was translated for them. They, they had no idea what those imams who are, none of the people that I can name, Faisal, uh, uh, Abu Hamza probably had more, was probably more knowledgeable than Faisal perhaps. And uh, Abu Qatada definitely beats both of those guys by far. 
and all of them were deviant takfiris and had different levels of deviance. And with that being the case, that uh, to busy the people with these things and you see how it can lead them astray, that they need to have what is useful for them and not involve in things way over their head. The Sheikh then says the sixth thing about uh, regarding Hajar and refutations. He said, refutation of the one who fell into error or made a mistake is fard al kifaya. He said, this is an obligation. As long as someone from the Ummah does this, then the sin is removed from uh, the rest. He says, thus, if some of the scholars shoulder the responsibility of cautioning the Ummah by way of refutation by which the legislative objectives are achieved, then the rest of the scholars are relieved of this obligation and free of blame. This is based upon widely recognized principles the scholars unanimously concur with, along with other communal obligations. So it's very important for us to understand, not everybody needs to get in, involved in the refutations. If a scholar or if a student of knowledge or whatever has been refuted, and it's been done based upon knowledge, not everyone has to jump on the bandwagon to prove their code of being a, a person of hajr, a person of refutation, or believing that this is salafia. No, not everybody has, has to get involved in that. Not everyone should get involved in that. Rather, it may be sufficient for that one scholar, if he has found some true error and, there, and it's based on knowledge and not desires, and he has made his case, then that may be sufficient. And if another scholar does, then that's fine. But everyone does not have to take a mokif. Everyone, what's your position? What's your position? What's your position? That kind of dawah was not the necessarily the position of the Salaf al -Sadeh. <clears throat> One of the most reprehensible and hideous mistakes that occur amongst the students of knowledge is that when a scholar refutes an individual who made a mistake, or when a fatwa is issued by him warning against this individual or against a particular mistake, many students who ascribe to following the sunnah and the scholars request from others to make bayan, a clarification of their position concerning this refutation or fatwa. How many times have we seen this and how many times will we continue to see what's your position on so-and-so? Uh, brother, you know, a group of masajid, they write a bayan about so-and-so or about a position of a certain fitna. We the Salafi Masajid of North America say this. We the Salafi Masajid of Birmingham say this. The Salafi Masajid in Croydon says this. The Salafi Masajid in, uh, you know, Brixton, they say this. And, you know, all of this ban, our ban is this. You know, this is, is, is more often than not absolutely not necessary. <clears throat> and as some of our scholars like Sheikh Saleh Suhaimi and others have, have made clear that this is, it's not from the Sunnah. We don't, this is not, this is something strange. And everybody jumping on the bandwagon and getting in the fitna. So he says, rather, this has reached such a degree that they even require from the younger students of knowledge and even from the layman to state and clarify their positions regarding this refutation and the one being refuted. They then conclude, in light of this, their position of al wala wal bara. Then they proceed to boycott one another based upon this. Shameful enough, some of the students may even boycott and abandon some of their own scholars whom they have benefited from for many years in the field of Aqidah due to this fitna. This fitna has even made its way into the homes of the believers to the extent that a man would even boycott his own brother and son would be disrespectful, rude, and shun his own parents. And perhaps a man may even divorce his own wife and separate himself from his own children due to this fitna. And trust me, this the Sheikh is not speaking from desires. He's speaking from the many countless reports that we have around the world. And we know some of the brothers were reprimanded about this, that brothers were making fatwa that they did not have the right to do that they were not even known for seeking knowledge made fatwa to where they broke up family oh your your sister your 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 husband is a hezbi you should actually consider divorce he's a mubtadiyah he's a follower of abu hassan he's a follower of this he's from these guys he's from the hadadiyah you need to break him break it up uh you know your children you guys will work it out because you're now on the sunnah you know, this is some strange ideology and a very dangerous concept, which only Allah knows how, 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 how this fitna has spread and harmed the Muslims. And this is why you see so many people now who, when you say anything about the Salafi Dawah, they hate, hate uh, the Salafis. You even have so many people who 
subscribe or ascribe to a greater or less extent to the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. But yet, when they hear the term Salafi, they flee and they speak ill and they say, because their concept is only of the people who propagated this instead of what the Salafi uh, minhaj is. The Shaykh then says, when you look at the community, you will find them divided into two or more groups, every group making accusations against the other and oblig obligating Hajar on the other. And the ironic thing is that all of the above is found with those who ascribe to following the Sunnah, those who before the emergence of this differing could not find anything derogatory to say about the other in relation to their Aqidah or in the soundness of their Minhaj. This is either the result of extreme ignorance of the Sunnah and the principles that were established by Ahl Sunnah in the realm of reprimand or due to Hawa following the desires. And we ask Allah for safety and preservation from this. So the Shaykh <clears throat> here is also making it very clear that a lot of these refutations and the implications of them, of spreading it to people who should not be involved in, in these issues and this fitna and smaller students of knowledge who propagate and who do it for various reasons, that it boils down to the a lot of times the people are doing this and involving themselves in fitna due to their desires uh, and or due, due to uh, a wish to be accepted. You know, because you see the people break into Ahzab. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulu hizbima ladayhim farahun, that they each group is rejoices in what they have. How many people, you know, you will find groups of brothers now with and I can name so many of the contemporary fitna, and I'm not going to, that's going on in some of the Salafi communities. And you you you'll see each group, each masjid, they have the same methodology. The same <laughs> <clears throat> Same scholars, basically. Maybe they differ now of a scholar that these ones have now believed is refuted and is no longer from Ahl Sunnah. Whatever the case may be, they have the same approach to Islam, but their Alwala and Bara is based upon the statement of one Sheikh or several Mashaikh. You know, they make love and hate. What's your position? Uh, you know. Even this book, this book is so controversial. How many students will say, you know, and how many times have I been criticized for, uh, you know, propagating this book and uh, mentioning this am amongst brothers? And <clears throat> people make awal awal bara. I know people, who, one particular individual, and I mentioned this prior, who were known for years, and he was a student of knowledge and everything, and he, mashallah, he won't, wouldn't dare not speak to me. You know, he cut me off a couple of years ago, which probably hurt him more than it hurt me. And the point being, Habit is making this love and this hate based upon these issues. That this is not permissible. That is Ayn al That is exactly what Hizbiyah is. If I say, even I would treat, especially a lay person who follows Faisal or someone who is a Tikfiri, I would not treat them that way that is not that would not be appropriate instead i would give them proofs and say you know the reason i warn you against him is for this reason and this reason and his excessive takfir and his mini masail and almiya that he makes mistake in and some of the statements he says about sahaba and other things you know you you have to make it clear for them and at the same time you don't boycott them and cut them off and stuff and this person is different than the one who is a, a takfiri like him who may have studied you know, who has another level of knowledge. This person, there may, there's uh, probably, there's more of a mas maslaha in cutting an individual off like that if the proofs have been established or there is harm in involving in a discussion with this individual that it's a harm to you and your religion or vice, you know, whatever the case may be. It's going to drive him further away from the sunnah. Whatever the case may be, as we talked about prior uh, with some of these masail, Letting us know that we don't need to involve ourselves in every fitna and that every, uh, you know, dealing with individuals is different. Dealing with the general Muslims is different than dealing with someone who is a person of knowledge on bid'ah. And again, this whole treatise, we have to remember, is about the brotherhood of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So it's about when there are issues and mistakes that come between Ahl Sunnah. And that's what our Shaykh uh, Imam Abdul Masan al Abad, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, also wrote his book, Rifkan, uh, Rifkan uh, 
you know, the, the gentleness uh, between Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah, you know, being brothers, his treaties, uh, our Sheikh uh, Muhammad Ali Imam in Yemen as well, his his excellent book Ibana, uh, so many uh, <clears throat> Sheikh uh, Bedr Al Urtabi, I believe it is, who wrote the book. Uh, about uh, have mercy on Salafia, and so many of the scholars have written uh, m many beneficial treaties dealing with some of these issues, trying to rectify and how should Ahl Sunnah deal with issues when they fall between them, not between Ahl Bidah. Ahl Bidah, that's a whole set of different ahkam. The, 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 the way you deal with that, in, if we go back to the Minhaj of the Salaf and we look back at those Masail, and issues we see that they it's different how you deal with someone who is a Sunni, Sunni meaning that they are on the Sunnah, not just that they are not Shia. That's not what we mean, but we mean that someone who's adhering to the book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Madhab of the Salaf. That's what we mean by Sunni. So how they deal with one another when they mistake make mistakes, or when they refute each other for whatever reason compared to refuting someone from Ahl Bidah whose usul, whose foundation has Bidah. You know, this person's already known as a pure Sufi and has many issues in Aqidah and Ibadat where they innovate is different than someone whose usul is, is Ahl Sunnah, usul is Salafi, but yet they fell into a mistake here or had a fatwa here that was a mistake, whatever the case may be. The way you deal with them is, is different. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ala Nabiya Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.